Hi, I'm going to, I'm Simon, uh, he's Andrew, I'm going to um, start us off. So um, we're not really, we're not going to be talking about um, uh, any tools that we've designed. Um, in fact, I'm just going to jump in and you'll find out what we're talking about. So that's a bit easier, isn't it, really? So I want to start by just uh, looking at a, a, an idea of um, recorded music as a schematic representation of performance rather than as a, a record of performance, if you like. Recording history is often sort of talked about in, in terms of a, um, audio quality, about the development of um, dynamic and frequency range, but it's also a history of clarity, and clarity is a form of distortion, really, because it's about creating clarity through schematic representations. Um, the little visual joke that I have prepared is not going to work, seeing as we have two screens, but you'll sort of work out what the visual joke was meant to be. Um, so we aren't fooled by schematic representations because they're schematic. They only represent the thing partially. The other thing about um, a schematic representation is that we perceive them both as a representation of something and as a representation in itself. So when we look at um, Leonardo's Burlington House cartoon, we can appreciate this both as a representation of people and as a beautiful and skillful drawing that, um, that some of the properties of the stimulus this provides to our retina um, relate to our experience of people, and some of them relate to our experience of drawings, and in particular of chalk and charcoal. So the difference between, um, it's, well actually, yeah, you can see it. It's a little dark, but you can see that there's quite a strong difference between the representation of Mary and Anne, not just in terms of them having different features, but in terms of the amount of realism or the amount of feature definition, whatever you, however you want to describe it, they're very differently represented in this single drawing. Okay, so that's uh, what, uh, to get on to the idea of recordings as schematic representations. Uh, just going to run through some of the ideas behind this very quickly, but um, if you want to know more about this, uh, come and speak to me afterwards. I'm, unfortunately, I've got to leave quite soon because um, we've got to be back in Ealing by two o'clock. So, um, uh, Jerome Feldman, Lakoff, and Johnson um, developed uh, this theory of metaphor uh, and the idea that uh, that the way we hear, well, I'm developing it into the way we hear, they're talking about the way we perceive in general, um, the way we hear can be described as sonic cartoons, which is where I'm going with it. The idea that, um, that specific features in a recording are distorted in ways that allow us to pick out schematic features that are more important than others, and others we can inhibit others so that because they're less important to us. All the things that we do when we're mixing, really, but also the things that performers do when they're performing. The um, other side of this is Gibson's ecological approach to visual perception from the 1970s, which Eric Clark has applied to um, uh, sound and music, they talk about the identification of invariant properties from a stimulus and the way that that produces affordances both in our interpretation and our expectations of action and what, um, what we should do in particular situations. The um, so just to, just to give a, a brief example about this, if I um, clap my hands quite
quietly and then <laughs> clap my hands loudly. There are several, several invariant properties that distinguish between those two sounds. The kinds of things that we can recognize with a hand clap, obviously amplitude is a key one, but um, the amount of high frequency content is also different in those two sounds. The, um, the envelope shape, there's a fractionally faster attack. And um, if I was hitting something other than, well, it probably is a difference in the resonance of my hands. It certainly feels like it now. But if I was hitting something metallic or wooden, it would resonate for longer when I hit it harder. So there, there are various invariant properties that we learn about that allow us to, um, to determine things like the energy level of an activity that's gone on. And um, what record production does a lot of the time, and this is why I call them cartoons, is that it uses some and not others. So when we use compression on um, a vocal or, a, well, on any signal, what we're doing is we're reducing the invariant property of amplitude change and allowing people or requiring people to hear the difference in energy level based on other invariant properties rather than the amplitude one. So they'll hear the difference through the timbre in terms of increased high frequency sound. Um, there are also, if we're talking about energy, one of the things that we want to um, talk about briefly is the idea of heaviness, just as using that as a, um, uh, as a descriptor and how we can drill down into the idea of heaviness a little bit. And although the energy level is one thing, the other thing that um, we often hear as being um, part of heaviness is the size of the thing that's making the noise. Big things sound heavier than smaller things. And obviously, one of the invariant properties of size is pitch. And, um, and so quite often in record production, heaviness can involve the introduction of things that increase the perception of size by adding low frequency content. Um, the um, thing that I was going to mention before this, which I haven't, which maybe I'll just ignore it, and we'll move on to the next, yeah, it's all right. Um, there is a sort of cross-modality between perceptions, which is what I was going to talk about, but there's also a lot of cross-modality cross between the invariant properties of particular um, things. So I've mentioned size and energy. Spatial perception also, um, in larger spaces typically have reverb times where the low frequency reverb lasts longer than the high frequency reverb. So we get a build up of energy in the low end. And so low frequency sound can also uh, give us a, a sense of larger spaces as well as larger objects. So I think this, um, well, let's, let's just move on to um, looking at some actual toys. This is Waves Crystal Lord Algae um, plugin. And um, I don't know how much you can um, read on this. I don't know how much I can read on this at the moment, actually. Uh, but what have we got here, Andrew? We've got. <coughs> oh, this one is the, um, this particular one is related to drums. But I think the interesting thing about this one is some of the, the things that have been discussed today already, looking at this kind of 1970s modality, it's sort of idea versus the, the uninitiated, these tools take a sort of halfway house, which is kind of interesting, where we have parameters such as compress, and options for comp that compression may involve haul, um, pinch, or smack, you know, with quite semantic words around the way that these, these processes work, which is, I think, as we, and, and some of these terms are then carried over into other versions of the same plugin. Uh, I'm no great advocate of this 
particular tool, I was going to say, but uh, it's just interesting from my perspective, the choice of language that's used in relation to things. And you may find, for example, pinch will suddenly appear or roof will appear in a treble control. So it's an interesting comparison, uh, interesting combination of um, classic sort of processing techniques and descriptors as we go through these. And again, we've got different models depending on whether we're processing guitars, vocals. Um, and again, we've got guitars here. So we're initial making decisions about whether they're clean, crunch, or indeed heavy. And uh, there's part of some of the audio examples that run alongside this, uh, which are best interrogated through the website. Um, there are some, some interesting sort of conclusions drawn around what this believes heavy to be and what other ways heavy can be. Um, I might just shall I continue into the, the yeah. kind of the, the sort of examples that we, we thought about. We actually started with a, a track here. This is a track I received some time ago. Um, and the idea here initially was just a case of there's a, in this case, an East London rapper who needs to put a needs to write to this um, instrumental um, sort of backing track, but was finding struggling for vibe energy, uh, and actually was hindering his creative process. So wanted a quick rough. When I say quick rough, I mean like twenty minutes quick rough, um, in order to receive some energy to help him with his writing process that was happening in the studio at the time. Uh, and there were a number of issues with the track that you couldn't help you can't help but notice. You'll hear a little bit in a second. Um, the guitars themselves are recorded through a pod, um, so there's a, a certain lack of realness, energy, um, weight, uh, heaviness, as we've been, as we're going to talk about. But also the uh, issues with the drums as well, uh, and that they are sort of very clean, very safe, um, but somewhat dominated by room, including the overheads themselves. Very little um, definition in the overheads. So there's a number of enhancements that need to take place that, again, provide us with certain um, affordances that we can look to work with around the idea of adding punch, adding drive, adding weight, adding energy, and this idea of intent. And I think this is really important, particularly where you've got a rapper who's looking to interact with this intent that needs to be placed onto the track. Um, so how do we go about, about doing these things? Um, so here's the, the raw track itself should play, hopefully. You can hear the guitars lack any sort of energy, urgency, excitement, and the drums, though safe, lack a certain degree of um, lack a certain degree of drive. It's fair to say, if you need to take with some enhancement. Um, so again, we know that the kick is lacking in energy and delivery and, and in punch. I like the idea of picturing this drummer again, this this sort of cartoon that we're thinking of. In this cartoon, this drummer, I want him to be holding massive drumsticks. Uh, this is the kind of visual. Um, kind of feeling here, but equally, I'm not envisaging a drummer with a massive kick drum and a tiny snare, which again is what we've got at the moment. So we need to make sure that all this is reflected, but we also want to paint an image of the room that the drummer is in and the energy associated with that room that's then also going to feed our rapper, um, who has yet to actually track his, his vocal in this case. So we want to create this, this feeling of a hard hitting drummer um, and hitting in the spaces as it sort of suggests there. So again, we've got the initial drums here for this section. There are some sort of timing issues, but just turn to traditional tools like compression, gating, etc., to add a little bit of punch to these. Um, and this is the version of here now. Going to be somewhat subtle in here compared with the examples that are on here. There's not really a phantom center as such, it's fair to say. Um, but we still have this feeling that the snare is laying back in the space. The kick drum now has, is starting to form, actually groove through the breathing of those various elements. This is slightly more subtle in here, but I think now you can hear the snare is now. I now start to feel like this drummer has got both hands of the same size and they're both holding sort of, well, big sticks as it were. To me, it's made it more believable because what we've done is we've removed energy from the room, actually in this case, just by using a, an expander um, from an SSL channel strip on the overheads to gently um, allow the snare through without being too destructive. And again, but I still don't have that feeling of the drummer laying in. So again, we instigated some kind of parallel process. In this case, it was a, 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 a thermionic culture on a parallel. But the important thing for me, I'm not really interested in what it was. I'm interested in the fact that now, I feel like as a rapper, I've got something to my head's gonna go to. And these are, this is, these are the kind of things I think that we've been hearing about today in terms of those interactions with, with the artist in this case. I don't want an auto rapper. I want a rapper who is going to inter interact with what's been been done here. 
Um, so the powerful face is bringing you that kind of in-the-face energy, but we're still lacking that breathing space energy that he wants because he wants it to feel live. The whole reason for using instrumentalists on this track rather than program material was to create a feeling of liveness. So there was a room mic in the room, um, but it was very messy. And again, with timing issues, it was leading to all sorts of problems. So again, gated the gently gated the room using the snare as the input, and again, using envelope to kind of create that feel of groove. Not thinking about what time it is, but thinking about what is the groove, where does the pocket feel? So it's like a pocket control at that point rather than, a, than anything else. But again, the room itself didn't have the properties that Simon was talking about in terms of the nature of the room. So that room is then enhanced by a further reverb, which adds some space onto that, which will shuffle in here. But again, you can listen to these examples on the website. Um, so the next problem comes around adding heaviness to the guitars, because the guitar sounds somewhat weak. Um, and there are lots of properties that we associate with heaviness, and, and actually frustratingly, as even as we've seen from today, a number of ways in which you can achieve heaviness, depending on how you're, you're looking, at, looking at managing this process. Um, so in this case, um, just one, one way of doing it was to use distortion, uh, decapitator, set to model E. For those of those, those of you with a 1970s mindset in terms of your, your thinking, that's an old EMI. Uh, channel strip being driven um, and it's I guess if you had to describe it you might suggest a beefy low end with a smooth sheeny top for example might be some kind of semantic description of the nature of the distortion profile of that particular tool and that takes our guitars that sounded like this and a definite enhancement in what we would consider heaviness through that that bottom end and as a second option we've got the decapitator model P uh, which is a pentode tube model, so it's going to be rife with um, uh, odd harmonics, um, and as such, offers a different kind of heaviness. Again, here's the clean, unprocessed one, and then we're into the the model P, which immediately starts to sound like it's on fire. So, oh yeah, that sounds like it's on fire, and you might associate that on fire with heaviness um, compared with the previous one, and we hear the previous one, and does it sound heavier? Well, this is an interesting discussion around what heavy really is. Um, the fascinating thing comes, of course, when you put it in the track, because we know we've got all that high order distortion in the double track guitars, which pulls the guitars wider, which to me removes heaviness. So it needs context in order to sound heavy. I will just literally just... So that's E in the track, against P in the track, hard to hear in there, but... For me, the guitars start to disappear off behind the drums, and I'm losing heaviness, because heaviness is in the intent of the implied dual performance of the drummer and the guitarist. So heaviness then starts to suggest community within that, that description of heaviness, which gets difficult. One last little thing to sort of add in here, which was, was quite interesting, added some tape to the, uh, to the guitars, which definitely did something in, in that kind of pocketing of the guitar and the placing of the guitar, but then when you add the bass, all of a sudden, I feel like I've processed my bass. So by placing tape on the guitar, I've pocketed the bass with the kick drum and also joined the bass into the guitar to create heaviness through the union of those three without touching the bass. So the bass is unprocessed. So again, this is going to provide a whole world of challenges in terms of finding ways of descri describing these things. Um, so yeah, and there's the, the lovely Pro Tools. Um, so you can see with very, in, in 20 minutes, with very little actual processing, um, beyond thinking about how do I need this to feel for my rapper to be able to think about writing to this, we go from something that's very light and a little bit lacking in energy to something that's... Con so I think there's quite a, not an unsubtle difference there, um, but sort of 20 minutes, 20 minutes of work and thinking about, say, based around those ideas that Simon spoke about earlier as a mentality and about plugging into those thoughts that we know the rapper has from the conversation that he's already had with the engineer. Um, so again, it's this idea of rather than why talk two languages when you can talk one. Hmm. Yeah. Um, rather than sum up, I'll just leave us now because we're, we're already... Yeah, I think we're hit, hit time past. there. So. <laughs> so.